Today, I'm pleased to introduce the presenter, Dr. Hung Wee Zhao, a senior research scientist in the electron microscopy core and manager of the FIB instrumentations here in the MRL. Hung Wee Zhao received a PhD in material science and engineering from North Carolina State University in 2005. After graduation, she worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory and then again at the NC State as a postdoc research associate uh, involved in working like, you know, STEM and TM advanced work there. Also work at the Oak Ridge Nas National Laboratory as a guest scientist. So we were lucky to have Hanwe join us to the in University of Illinois as part of our team since 2012. She's, uh, again, as I said, a re senior research scientist with vast experience in electron microscopy and FIB and so on. This is actually the second presentation that Hongwei gives in this series. She gave a, a webinar before on the basics of scanning electron microscopy. So check that video available as well uh, if, you, if you have the chance. So with that, I would like to thank you very much, Hongwei. I knew you put, I know you put a lot of time to put together this presentation. Uh, we appreciate your time for, for developing this material and we appreciate the privilege of having you here giving this presentation to us. So without any further further delay, I would like to welcome here to the series. Thank you, Hanwei. Thank you, Mara. Um, sorry, somehow he went forward. Okay. Yeah, so um, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today I'm going to introduce focused eye uh, beam technique. So I will start with FIB instrumentation, followed by a few common applications. Then I will discuss the uh, <coughs> practical aspects of the operation, including a few issues you may have in FIB processing. Finally, I will briefly cover some new developments in FIB instrumentation. So the first part, uh, FIB uh, optics. So as the name uh, suggests, the focused eye beam uses a stream of focused eye. Oh, sorry, some I didn't click. Why it didn't really, okay. As uh, the name suggests, the focused ion beam uses a stream of focused ions. So before we start, uh, let's first review the basic idea of SEM. Since uh, the instrumentation wise, the FIB is similar to SEM in many ways. Uh, in SEM, uh, <coughs> electron probe is formed using source, lenses, and apertures. The probe is uh, scanned on the sample in a rest pattern. Various signals are generated through the interaction of the beam and the specimen. Uh, these signals will be picked up by detectors, providing information on the area being scanned. So basically, FIB is a, an observing and analyzing tool, non-destructive to, to most materials. So why focused ion beam? Electrons are not uh, the only charged particles that can be accelerated and focused. Uh, the purpose of using ion beam is sputtering. Ions have much greater mass than electrons. Even the lightest ion still has almost 2,000 times the, the mass of electron. So when the focused ion beam strikes the sample sputtering will occur, uh, removing sample materials in a controlled way. Um, this cannot be done with SEM. FIB is commercialized in 1980s with the, the driving force from the growing semiconductor industry uh, to precisely locate invisible defects. Uh, then it rapidly spread over many academic areas. So simply put, uh, the, the FIB is used to remove material to a high depth and the spatial accuracy. And also, as we will see later, FIB can also be used to build structures when precursor gas is introduced. The FIB is similar uh, to that of SCM in terms of optics. So it starts 
with the uh, ion source. Uh, there are many different ion sources used in FIB instruments, such as uh, liquid metal, uh, plasma, uh, gas field. So in this talk, we will just focus on gallium liquid metal ion source, which is the most commonly used and uh, also what we have here at MRL. Uh, other ion sources will be briefly covered in the last part of this talk. So after the source, they are focusing lenses. Like in SEM, they are condenser lens that forms the beam and uh, also the objective lens that focuses the beam onto the sample. The difference, the difference here is the FIB uses electrostatic lens instead of electromagnetic lens. The reason is the magnetic force in magnetic lenses is dependent on the particle velocity. Uh, the, the ion beam has very low velocity, therefore it requires a much stronger magnetic field to generate uh, the force, which means the magnetic lens will be too large to fit into the ion beam column. Uh, electric static lens are independent of uh, the particle velocity, therefore uh, are used in FIB. In FIB, the current, ion beam current is set by beam selective aperture, which is an aperture strip with uh, different sized circular holes. Uh, the larger the aperture, the larger uh, the ion beam. A uh, blanking plate is used to, to deflect the beam away from the optical axis uh, when the ion beam is not needed. And uh, the rest is just the same as SEM. The construction of the liquid uh, metal ion source. Uh, there is a tungsten needle uh, heating wire, metal reservoir, uh, suppressor, and uh, extractor. The most widely used uh, metal is gallium. So there are advantages of using gallium. Uh, it, it, it doesn't form alloy with tungsten, and also it has a low melting point and a low vapor pressure, and a reasonable wetting with the, 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 the tungsten needle. The ion emission mechanism is a combination of field ionization and uh, field evaporation. When heated, um, the, the liquid metal will flow to the tip of tungsten needle, uh, forming a tailor cone at the, the wetted tungsten tip. Uh, the electric field at the end of this uh, cone, the cone will be high enough for electrons uh, to tunnel from gallium atoms into the tungsten tip. Uh, the ionized gallium ions then will be uh, field evaporated. Um, FIB can be stand alone, um, but most FIB systems also have an uh, electron uh, beam, just like uh, SEM, and we call them FIB SEM instruments. The SEM column just like uh, it's vertical, just like you see in SEM. The FIB column is placed at an angle, usually like 50 to uh, 60 degrees offset to the SEM column. So both beams are scanned on the targeted area of the specimen. And of course, there are detectors as well. Um, as you see in any SEMs imaging detector. And sometimes there are also analytical detectors such as uh, EDS or EBSD. Uh, these detectors allow imaging and analyzing uh, the milled surfaces. And there is a gas injection system, GIS, and also the nano manipulator or lift out needle. And these two will be covered uh, for more details later. And then, um, for, of course, there's a high precision sample navigation system stage. Uh, so the FIB system combines the benefits of FIB and the SEM. The milling and the deposition can be controlled with nanometer pre uh, precision. 
the E beam and the I beam uh, will intersect um, a point inside the column. And the distance between this uh, point and the, the, the electron uh, column, uh, the, the end of the pole piece is called the eccentric height. The beam intersection point is also on the tilting axis um, of the stage. So that at this height, when the stage is tilted, the feature remains in the same position. Uh, this layout allows immediate high resolution SEM imaging of the fib milled surface. So that's the eccentric height. There are three operation modes, uh, electron beam only, ion beam only, both beams on. So in electron beam only, uh, usually we do high resolution imaging and uh, also uh, for E-beam induced deposition. And of course you can just use this system um, like any SEM. And ion beam only for milling and the deposition. Uh, you can also do imaging using ion beam but at a cost of sample surface damage. And when both beams are on, this allows real-time E-beam uh, imaging of the milling process. So when the, the ion beam is turned off, only E-beam is running. The instrument runs just like SEM. Uh, secondary electron, backscatter electrons are used for imaging. Uh, you, can, uh, you may also see in-lens detector available. Uh, for ultra high resolution imaging. And uh, you can also do EDS to get composition information or EBSD to get uh, crystallographic information if you have uh, the, right, uh, uh, the right detectors installed. Uh, ion beam and the specimen interaction is uh, quite complicated. Here we will just focus on the signals commonly used in FIB SEM system. So the ion lo uh, loses energy through two types of interactions, elastic and inelastic. Uh, the secondary ions are generated through uh, elastic interaction. Incident ion interacts with the nucleus of the, the atoms in the sample, uh, leading to sample atoms ionized and uh, emitted from the surface. Uh, the detector for ions is not the scintillator type of detector used in uh, SCM for electrons. It's a channel uh, electron multiplier. It detects all positive ions regardless of their mass. Uh, the mass and the charge of secondary ions can also be analyzed if a SIMS detector is available, uh, but that's a FIPS SIMS system will be covered in, in this talk. The type of detector can, this type of detector can also be used for secondary electron detection just by switching uh, the bias to positive. In our helios and the cells, it's called the ice detector. Um, so the secondary electrons are also generated. Uh, that's through inelastic interaction um, where the, the incident ion interacts with the with the electron cloud of sample atoms leading to sample atom electrons e ejected. Uh, secondary electron can be detected using ETD just like in SEM. In elastic scattering events also result in uh, phonons generation and of course there are also uh, uh, backscattered uh, um, ions which is gallium in this case for gallium FIB. Uh, these are the signals we, we don't use. Uh, so in FIP, uh, the ion beam both uh, works as a milling beam and the imaging probe. Uh, but we have to be aware that imaging with ion beam is destructive. Um, here is a comparison between the FIP mode secondary electron imaging and the SEM mode secondary electron imaging. Both are secondary electron imaging. The difference here is uh, one is induced by ion, one is induced by electron. Uh, the most striking difference is the strong grain contrast shown in the FIB image. Uh, this is due to channeling effect. 
um, the incident uh, ions will channel between lattice planes of the sample and depth of the penetration of the incident ion varies with the relative angle between the ion beam and the lattice plane as well as the interplane spacing. Uh, the higher depth of penetration, the lower secondary electron yield. So for example, uh, ions penetrate deeper into materials in uh, low index directions such as 100 zero, zero, uh, due to a larger uh, lattice spacing. So the secondary electron yield is lower if the grain is aligned with the beam. Uh, th uh, this means these grain will appear darker in the image. Another difference is the material contrast seems to be opposite in two images. In, in this set of images, a lead which is heavier and is brighter than tin in SEM mode, but it's darker than tin in FIB mode. The reason is that the ion induced secondary electron yield uh, decreases with atomic number uh, opposite to that in SEM. In SEM, the total secondary electron yield largely comes from uh, excited uh, by backscatter electrons, uh, which increases with atomic number. Uh, the topographic contrast is similar. Also, um, secondary electron yield is much higher in FIB mode. So one incident ion can generate way more secondary electrons than one incident electron. Another difference we don't really see here is these two images, uh, we don't really see here uh, is the, 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 ion, the, the FIB image is uh, more surface sensitive. The fifth mode image sensitive because uh, actually that's for amorphous material only, uh, for crystalline material there is a channeling. Uh, that, that's because it has a much shorter uh, range, ion has much shorter range, smaller interaction volume. Uh, for example, as shown in this table, uh, in silicon, uh, the 30 kV gallium uh, ion range is only 40 nanometer compared to 6 micron for 30 uh, kV um, electron and the 1500 nanometer for, for 1.5 kV electron. So this is uh, compared with the SEM image uh, from the total secondary electron uh, emission, including SE1, SE2, SE3. And SE2 and SE3, we know that are strongly dependent on the number of backscatter electrons. Finally, of course, imaging with ions provides uh, different information contrast, but it is at the cost of sample uh, consumption. Uh, now a, compar a comparison between the secondary electron imaging and the secondary ion imaging. Now both in FIB mode, which means both are induced by ion beam. The, the, the image area here contains both insulating and uh, conductive regions. We can see that insulating region appears dark in the secondary electron imaging. Um, in, in indicating that there is no or very little uh, secondary electron being detected. Uh, the conductive region appears normal, showing topographic information as it, it's supposed to. The contrast difference is due to the uh, positive charge accumulated on the insulator surface as a result of gallium ion implantation as well as their secondary electron emission. Uh, the secondary electrons either <coughs> with this positive charge, the secondary electrons either won't be able to escape from the sample surface or are attracted back after emission. So no secondary electrons uh, reach secondary electron detector. Therefore, no, uh, the contrast appears dark. The secondary eye image clearly shows the details of the feature since uh, secondary eye emission detection is not that affected. And charging will also affect uh, milling and uh, deposition, uh, but uh, this part will be covered later in this talk. 
Uh, gas injection system is a critical attachment in FIB system. It delivers a controlled flow of gas uh, to the sample surface through a long nozzle. There are two purposes of using gas. Uh, one is material deposition, uh, <coughs> which is necessary for nanofabrication, sample protection, and the lift out work. Also, uh, enhanced uh, preferential etching, which makes milling more efficient by enhancing the sputtering rate of materials or to preferentially mill one material over uh, another. Another important attachment for FIB is lift out uh, nano manipulator, uh, which is necessary for in situ lift, lift out work. It is a sharp tungsten probe uh, we use this needle to lift out a small sample section, move and attach it to a sample support or another area of choice uh, on the sample for, for further FIB processing. Uh, for example, when we prepare samples for TEM and uh, atom probe tomography. Uh, both electron beam and ion beam imaging are used to navigate uh, the needle precisely to the right position. The mechanism for gas-assisted deposition. Uh, the precursor gas delivered by GIS uh, will be absorbed on the surface and deabsorbed, diffused. Um, the, the gas molecules are cracked by incident electron beam or uh, ele uh, incident ion beam, and generating a volatile product and a non-volatile product. The non-volatile products stays as a deposit. The volatile products are remo removed by vacuum pump or uh, deposit uh, in the chamber wall. With GIS, we can deposit a broad range of materials. So these are the ones available from Thermal Fisher uh, Scientific. And there's a carbon deposition, platinum deposition, and tungsten, and uh, gold. So at MRL, we have a carbon and a plantium GIS. One thing we have to be aware is uh, the deposit material is not a pure, uh, it contains the organic part of the precursor gas, uh, usually carbon and oxygen, and also gallium if we use ion beam to introduce uh, the uh, deposition. So back, sorry. Yeah, so from this table, we can see that when we deposit plantum using ion beam, uh, the actual material we get contains a significant amount of uh, carbon and uh, oxygen and uh, also gallium because we use the ion beam. The actual composition depends on the environment uh, where the deposition takes place. Uh, for example, base vacuum, GIS vacuum, uh, the also the voltage, accelerating voltage. Before we get to the gas enhanced etching, let's first look at the mechanism for milling. Uh, without gas injection, milling comes from physical sputtering of the sample atoms, uh, which occurs as the result of momentum transfer, transfer from the, inc the incident ions to the sample atoms. The surface <coughs> atoms can be ejected as a sputtered particle only if it receives sufficient energy to, to overcome the surface binding energy of the sample material. And then, of course, the sputtered atoms are pumped away or deposited in a chamber. The gas-assisted etching can be used to enhance sputtering rate of material or preferentially remove one material over another. Uh, the mechanism here is uh, the, the etching gas molecule is again cracked by either ion or electron, uh, this time decomposed into reactive species. These species further react with the, the sample material into uh, volatile compounds and the volatile compounds will be pumped away or deposited in the chamber. So 
uh, here the requirement that we mentioned earlier that the energy the sample atoms re receive uh, should be high enough to overcome the surface binding energy is bypassed. Um, the preferential etching is achieved by uh, choosing a proper gas which only reacts with one material or one type of material. Uh, commercially available reactive gases, uh, again, uh, these are from thermal science, Fisher Scientific, uh, the selective carbon mill and uh, insulator enhanced etching, and also the delineation uh, etch. So in selective carbon uh, mill, um, um, it's the, the gas used is actually uh, water vapor. So this table shows the comparison on the milling yield with uh, and without water vapor. So we can see that the water enhanced milling yield for carbon-based material uh, tremendously. At the same time, it slows down uh, the removal rate of many other materials. And this image shows the result of water enhanced etching. We can see that uh, the, the polyamide is removed while the aluminum metal is still uh, intact. So now let's move to uh, the next part, application. The building block for FIB work is patterning. Patterning is the process of uh, uh, creating micro to nano size structures uh, in or on the sample surf uh, surface near um, iron beam milling, a uh, rear iron beam milling or gas assisted uh, deposition. Um, these are basic, they are basic shape patterns, the basic shape patterns. And this one is uh, during a FIP, uh, sorry, TM sample prep. And we use a rectangular pattern to, uh, to do the to deposit protection layer. And we use uh, this uh, cross section pattern to to, to dig trenches uh, from both sides. And uh, these pillars are made with a uh, circle uh, pattern. And also we use a build pattern array. So in addition to these basic patterns, we can also do the bitmap pattern and the stream file patterning. So with these basic building blocks combined with lift out capability, we can make many complex structures, uh, just like this uh, 30 micron tall uh, snowman. I believe the processes involved uh, are lift out milling deposition. So the most popular application of FIB is cross uh, sectioning. Through cross-sectioning, uh, features that are hidden underneath the sample surface can be reviewed, imaged, and uh, analyzed. Compared with conventional cross-sectioning method, um, using FIB is allow us to, to, to do uh, site-specific um, cross-sectioning, uh, which cannot be done with a conventional method. So cross-sectioning usually starts with uh, uh, depositing a protective uh, layer to the sample surface uh, from ion beam and um, E beam with ion beam or E beam. And uh, then we just uh, milled to expose the subsurface uh, using cross-sectioning pattern using ion beam. Uh, after that, we will uh, polish that, uh, polish or clean the cross-section surface with a smaller ion beam and then of course we image it or analyze it. Uh, there's uh, also a 3D serial sectioning and a 3D reconstruction and this is also called a 3D tomography. Um, a series uh, of sec cross-sectioning is done by ion beam in which uh, control the slice of material uh, in the area of interest are removed. And after each uh, cross-sectioning, the, the cross-section surface is imaged uh, using electron beam and uh, analyzed, uh, uh, analyzed if 
chemical uh, crystallographic um, analysis is desired and if we have the right detector, of course. And the acquired uh, sequential stack of images and the analysis results uh, provides a 3D data set for structural reconstruction. Another important FIB application in material science is uh, TM sample preparation. Uh, similarly, the, the advantage of using FIB is uh, site-specific. Uh, site the TM sample is prep is complicated process. It requires the operation of two attachments simultaneously, uh, the GIS and the lift out needle. The process can be uh, separate, separated into uh, uh, six individual steps, which will be demonstrated in the next few slides. So uh, usually we first deposit a thin protective uh, layer. Uh, we start with E-beam and then thin E-beam induced the protective layer and then a thicker uh, Ebe uh, ion beam induced protective layer. And then we will do uh, dig two trenches from both sides of the protected area. And then we will do J cut to separate the, the not completely separate um, the, the lamella from the bulk of the substrate. And then we do the lift out. The, the step three, so this one is after 90 degree rotation, still side of view, but after 90 degree rotation. So we can see from the side after uh, J cut. And then we do lift out. To do lift out, we use a needle and we weld this lamella to the tip of the needle. And then we separate uh, from the other side and then we lift out. So then we move this uh, TM grid in and uh, move this lamella in and weld this lamella to the TM grid and uh, release the needle. And then the final step is thinning and polishing. And this is very uh, critical um, for TM sample prep. So we, st we, we start with a 30 kV high voltage ion beam to thin the sample and uh, finished by using low voltage polishing to remove uh, the damaged layer like amorphous or ion implantation. So these are the, the videos I recorded during uh, kind of uh, TM sample preparation demo. So we start to locate the area of interest and then we do a deposition of protective layer. So the layer is deposited. And now the second one is we are going to mill the trenches from both sides. So we call rough cutting and cleaning. So that's cleaning. Okay, now we want to draw the J cut, perform the J cut. So now lamella lift out. Okay, so the final is uh, not final, not yet lamella mounting. So now the thinning 
and the polishing. The bright layer, that's the protective layer on the top. Okay, so atom probe tomography, the only material analysis technique that can do both 3D imaging and uh, chemical composition measurement at atomic scale. So our, our next webinar is about uh, an atom probe tomography. Um, so here I'm just going to focus on the sample prep part. Atom probe uh, sample is a very sharp tip. There are two ways to make it, electrochemical polishing and a FIB. Again, the advantage of using FIB is being site uh, specific. The ideal shape of uh, atom probe is like this uh, hemispherical uh, spherical cap with a diameter around 50 nanometer and sitting on a truncated cone with a half shank angle between like five to 10 degrees. And also there should be no uh, paras uh, parasitic uh, spikes uh, within 10 micron from the tip. So again, the preparation is uh, similar to TM sample prep requiring the operation of two attachments simultaneously. So you do protective layer and uh, now we do wedge cut. So cutting, cleaning and uh, lift out then it will be mounted on the uh, Kamika micro tip coupon post. So again, this image is rotated 90 degree, still side view. So we have an individual mount and then we sharpening and the polishing. So the step four and three will be repeated until uh, the number of the individual mounts is enough or this wedge is material is used up. So usually you need uh, more than one, a few at least. So that's the, again, a video protective layer. And now we are cutting to form the wedge. So that's the cleaning. Now we get ready for the needle. So weld it to the needle. And we need to separate, release it so that the wedge can be lifted out. So mounting the wedge on the post. So we deposit plantum Now we separate, so we get individual mount now. Now we do the sh sharpening and the polishing. Okay, FIPS are able to make a wider ranges of structure just by milling. So these pillars are made using circle pattern. And they are prepared for nanoscale compression tests using MRL's nano indenter uh, to study uh, small scale intermittent deformation um, dynamics. Another example of what FIB can do, a slice of carbon fiber was cut uh, with a thickness less than one micron. Uh, it's lifted and placed on a gold chromium patterned electric circuit for transverse electrical resistivity measurement. The four incisions here are made with uh, the FIB cutting and uh, these four uh, electrodes are uh, that electrically connect the slice of fiber 
with the circuit is also done by FIP. That this time is by the deposition. So the practical aspect of the FIP operation, uh, as previously mentioned, the patterning is the basic building block for FIP work. So before we go further, we'll, let's take a look at the patterning parameters. First, the parameters that define the, the beam, accelerating voltage and the beam current. Accelerating voltage determines the incident ion beam and energy, and the beam current determines the, the ion beam probe size as well as the ion dose uh, the sample receives per unit time. So therefore, the ion current affects the precision and the rate of milling. And the, then the parameters define how the, the beam is scanning on the sample to achieve the pattern we set. So they are pixel uh, time. The pixel time sets the time that uh, the ion beam stays in one spot before moving to the next one. And then of course there are scan directions and the pixel overlap or pitch. So usually for a smooth milling edge, the overlap is set as uh, positive uh, for, for like 50%. For the position, we use zero or negative overlap to reduce the sample damage. So we can see here the, the dwell time and number of passes are linked. So to reach the same depths, if the pixel time is short, then more passes will be uh, needed. The dwell time and the overlap are optimized in application files. So unless you see issues, you don't have to adjust them. The first issue I would like to discuss is damage during the position or bad deposition. First, we have to be aware that there is always a competition between depositing and the sputtering. Uh, both takes ions. So the ions, if not used for cracking the a precursor gas will sputter the sample. So to successfully deposit the precursor material, we will need uh, roughly the same amount of ions and the precursor molecules to be over uh, the deposition area at the same time. When the current is low, uh, ion current is low, high efficiency for ion dose but not all gas molecules participate in the deposition. The deposition rate will be slow. When the current uh, is high, uh, that's high efficiency for gas usage, but only part of ion dose participate in the deposition. The rest ions are milling the sample, you causing damage. So there could be more milling than deposition. So for different, for efficient deposition, uh, the position, the ion current used must be uh, in proportion to the size of the deposition area. So we want to select the ion current depending on the pattern size. If uh, the, the area of interest is at the top surface of the sample or interface is what we want to study, we usually uh, protect the surface by pre-depositing an E-beam induced protective layer. And also we can open the gas valve and wait till the gas saturates above the sample surface before uh, starting the ion beam. The following issues are we are going to discuss are related to milling. So we will start with a close look, closer look at the, the ion beam interaction. As we see earlier, the ion specimen, inter, uh, specimen interaction generates secondary electron and the secondary ion, and then also, of course, they are surface atom sputtering. However, uh, the ion specimen interaction is not confined to top surface. Actually, a single incident ion can collide with multiple sample atoms, creating a cascade until it has lost all its energy and get implanted inside the sample. So when incident ion can can lead to several um, sample atoms to, to sputter. So we define the sputtering yield as the number of uh, atoms sputtered per incident ion. 
for the for a sample atom to be sputtered, there are two requirements. First, they have to uh, receive inf enough energy to overcome the binding, binding energy of the specimen uh, sample. Uh, and they should be at or close to the sample surface. So the sputtering yield depends on material, uh, incident beam energy, and also the beam incident angle. So the actual milling rate is dependent on both sputtering yield and the beam current. As mentioned in the last slide, sputtering yield depends on the surface binding energy, uh, therefore uh, material. So from this table, we can see uh, silicon has a relatively low sputtering yield and gold has a relatively high uh, sputtering yield. And it also uh, depends on the accelerating vo voltage, which determines the ion beam energy. And uh, we can see here the effect of accelerating voltage on the um, sputtering yield. And uh, the other, the so, so the curtaining is the, <laughs> are the vertical lines we see on the cross-section surface after uh, milling. And this is due to the sputtering yield dependence on the beam incident angle. At higher incident angle, the, the collision cascade is predominantly dominantly located directly ben beneath the surface. Um, that means more near surface sample atoms uh, receive enough energy to, to get sputtered. Although the incident beam direction is fixed, uh, the roughness on the sample surface and uh, voids or particles within the sample can create uh, different incident angles for the ion beam and therefore uh, different sputtering yield. So curtaining can be reduced or removed by uh, depositing a smooth layer on the sample surface uh, using uh, GIS deposition. And uh, we can also use lower beam current, ion beam current, and the polish from different angles. Um, for curtaining due to porous sample, you may also try embedding the sample in resin before fitting so that the resin will uh, fill the pores of the sample. Another commonly seen issue is redeposition. So that is sputtered sample atoms. Instead of being removed by pumping, uh, they deposit back or onto other sample areas. Deposition not only reduces the milling rate, also cause uh, some undesired topography affect the structure quality. For example, when we mill a trench, we won't be able to get a straight sidewall and uh, the maximum aspect ratio is also limited. So the sputtered atoms um, should be removed by pumping. But when the sputtering rate is really high and uh, if it's a confined space, uh, these will be redeposited. So the redeposition or redeposit material is most, most commonly found behind the, the milling pattern. So we can optimize the patterning strategy to, to reduce the redeposition problem. Uh, we can reduce the milling rate by using lower current and even lower voltage. Uh, we can set a shorter dwell time so that the ion beam scans many times over the area which can remove the redeposited uh, material. Uh, we can also, uh, we should also control the scan direction so that um, the redeposit won't be on the structures uh, being created. Uh, these are a few examples. So during uh, TM sample prep, uh, we we do the when we do cross sectioning and the cleaning, we want the scan direction towards this lamella. And when we do J cut, so when we do J cut, we want these uh, run in parallel and also the corners are overlap. 
And when we prepare the sample for atom probe, we want the milling from outer to inner. As mentioned previously, a single incident ion collides with multiple atoms, uh, creating a, a cascade until it lost the energy it carries. This collision uh, cascade generates many defects, like vacancies, interstitials, and also there are implanted ions. Uh, so that means many atom positions are changed by the incident ion beam near the surface. Uh, when there is a sufficient ion dose, the long range order of the sample crystal structure could be lost. Then we get this amorphous phase. So this image shows the amorphous layer formed on silicon as a result of uh, 30 kV gallium milling. Uh, whether to form amorphous phase and the thickness of amorphous layer depends on the beam energy as well as the sample material. Uh, structure. For sample prep, the material is set, of course, so we need to minimize the amorphous layer in the sample. It is very critical for high resolution stem and uh, yields. So what we can do is coat the sample with a protective layer before uh, depositing an ion beam induced protective layer. You can even sputter coating some layer uh, before you put the sample uh, into the fib. And we can use low voltage polishing and to finish up the sample. Lower energy ions have a shorter ranges, smaller interaction volume. So the, the amorphous layer will be uh, much thinner. We can see clearly here, the low voltage cleaning uh, effectively reduce the amorphous layer thickness. A summary on the relationship between uh, milling artifacts and the uh, uh, patterning parameter. I guess I need to go faster. So the redeposition closely related to milling rate. So you want to control the milling rate and uh, you can um, design the, the pattern scan direction so that to reduce the redeposition problem. The curtaining related to uh, uh, surface topography and uh, also material. So you can coat the surface and the material difference will also cause uneven milling. And ion implantation, uh, of course, uh, is strongly dependent on the accelerating voltage. As we discussed earlier, for non-conductive samples, uh, positive charge will build up uh, due to ion implantation and uh, secondary electron emission. As a result, secondary electron emission will be suppressed, which will mean that there won't be many secondary electron signal for the detector. The incident ion beam will also be affected by the positive charge. It will be deflected as a result, we get bad, uh, bad milling or bad deposition, uh, like this one shown here. Uh, this is a plantium patch and it's supposed to be inside this green square, but it's So the solution here, we use an electron flood gun to deliver electrons to, to compensate the positive charge, to prevent buildup of the positive charge. And uh, we can see from this image that with charge neutralization, um, we do have a decent pattern. So the last part, uh, the driving force, so new developments in FIB instruments. The driving force for developing new FIB instruments are uh, faster milling time, so that you can do large volume micro machining. Also uh, for imaging milling with a higher resolution and then reduce specimen damage work uh, to make uh, biological samples. So the plasma fib is developed for faster milling. One of the limitation of gallium fib is the maximum milling rate is limited. So gallium ion has a, is a point source. 
it requires defocus uh, at higher currents. So, so the maximum current with a focus probe is only 65 nano ampere. It, this makes it impossible to do large volume mi micro machining. Uh, in comparison, uh, the, the plasma fib, the beam is more uh, collimated. Although the, virtual, although the virtual source is larger, it is able to, to maintain a focused spot even at a very large current. Uh, this can be seen clearly here uh, with, the, with the probe size 2.5 micron spot, the gallium only has a 50 nanoamp uh, current and for the plasma, xenon plasma, um, the same probe size, it can have a more than 2000 nanoamp current. So another limitation of the, the, the uh, gallium fib is the gallium ion implantation which will uh, lead to phase change or segregation to green boundaries. All these will affect material properties. Uh, the xena is inert, so it, it, it won't have this kind of problems. And also it's been reported that the, the plasma, the xena uh, plasma FIP actually indu induces thinner amorphous layer than gallium FIP. So laser FIP is also uh, for a large area, extremely large area cross-sectioning. <coughs> and the, the material removal mechanism is different, is laser ablation. So you can do very fast material removal, uh, 15,000 faster than typical gallium <coughs> ion beam. And it can also process challenging materials such as non-conductive uh, ion beam sensitive sample. And also, it, the damage is minimum because extremely short duration of this um, laser pulse. So helium neon ion microscope is developed for higher resolution imaging and uh, milling. It combines the ultra high resolution microscopy and the nano fabrication technique. Uh, or you can see it overcomes some of the deficiencies of SEM and the FIB. The simulation for simulation for trajectory of uh, 30 keV gallium and 1 keV electrons and the 30 keV helium shows that helium has a narrow excited volume near the surface where secondary electron uh, escapes. So in another words, the lateral <laughs> size of the interaction volume near the surface uh, for gallium ion is very close to the probe size. Uh, this means there is no or very little sec second SE2 uh, emission or so the SE2 won't contribute to the image. Uh, this is why we call the microscope instead of uh, FIB. So helium neon microscope is good for imaging uh, uncoated uh, insulating materials. Since, and you can see clearly from these two images. Um, <coughs> so this plot is uh, the edge scan over um, this region. And we can see the, the, the edge, the, it's much narrow with the, the, the helium ion than the electron image because of the SE, uh, negligible SE2 contribution. Uh, since this is the ion beam, so it can be also, uh, we can also do high resolution material modification, uh, which means nano machining. So there are also multi-species FIB and <coughs> the ion species defines the lateral resolution, the depth resolution, also sputtering yield and the kind of contamination. So the advantage of having different ion species is you will have better control on the milling and the imaging uh, by selecting different ions. And also it will reduce or even eliminate contamination due to unwanted uh, ion implantation. So cryofib, 
Uh, the advantage of using SIP to make a biological sample is stress-free. So samples will not show the effect of shear stress or scratch, scratch mark due to cutting by diamond knives. Uh, but there is a radiation damage uh, by FIB, so which will damage the sample or cause a lot of defects. So that's the reason cryofib is developed. So the biological sample, yes, yeah, so these are more uh, <laughs> damaged by the, radi uh, the radiation of iron. So the cryo stage keeps the sample, can keep the sample at a cryogenic temperature. And we can use cryofib to, to study a biological sample or other uh, beam sensitive samples with minimum radiation damage. And we can also study wet uh, water containing samples where the low temperature keeps vapor uh, pressure of the sample below the operating pressure of the system. And finally, of course, we can prepare uh, lamella for vitrify the sample for cryo PM. So we have two FIPS at MRL, Helios 600i and uh, Sios 2. So the, this table shows the specifications of the two uh, instruments. So our next webinar is atom probe tomography. Uh, will be presented by Dr. Zweig and uh, uh, Dr. Spela. Uh, please register if you are interested in that, this technique. And if you have uh, questions about the FIB, uh, please contact us. Thank you. All right, Henry. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation with lots of details there. Uh, we are pretty much running out of time, but we have time for these three questions here. The first one is regarding lift out. Yeah. Does the needle just attach itself via uh, by Van der Waals forces, or is there a gluing agent that has to be used? Mm, sorry, I don't really understand this question. How, how does the needle, when you do the lift out, how does the needle attach to the sample and lift it up? Is there a gluing agent or is just like some... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, we use a deposition. We kind of deposit a patch to glue this needle to that piece of sample. Okay. And uh, we mechanically drive this needle. We can use the electron beam imaging and the ion beam imaging to navigate. We see exactly where it is. Good. So for the lamella lift out of the TM grid, when you do the J cut, yeah. does it matter which side you attach the needle to or can you do the J cut either way? You can do, no, you, you can only do one side because, uh, because you can, you don't want to free the lamella completely, then it will fall, right? So you still leave a tiny piece there and uh, the needle has to be welded to the free end. And uh, also the needle is fixed in, in terms of the position on the chamber. So the needle can only go into one direction. Okay. Now one more question here is about, I think you comment on that, about the gallium contamination when you do the, the, the fib work. So w while we're doing with the trench, gallium could actually be deposited in the wall of the lamella. So polishing could help anyhow to remove them. I think you discussed this in slide 50, but if you could, if you want to elaborate more. Um, you mean how to? How to get rid of the gallium that will actually will be deposited on the side wall. Oh, okay. Actually, when we do polishing, we tilt the sample a little bit. So especially low voltage, like 2 kV polishing, it almost covers the whole sample. Okay. It's not really vertical from the top. One more question that just popped up here, popped up here was the, do you have any recommendations for the electron and ion beam energies, currents and so on, uh, when you are milling and imaging layers that are very thin, like 10, 20 nanometers. Also, uh, what works better for enhancing the contrast between grains when using ion imaging? Um, the ion imaging, you, can, you already have a pretty good grain contrast. 
And you mean the first question is to image a very thin layer? Well, yeah, I think he's talking about the whole thing, like, you know, very thin layer, 10 to 20 nanometers. And then what are the settings, the best settings, energy, current, whatever, uh, so for you, getting an imaging? Yeah, you want to go low voltage for sure, because you want the image very surface sensitive. You want to catch the details on the surface. You want to go low voltage for sure. Okay. So with that, uh, you guys can see how we email on the screen there. So if you have more questions or if you want to go in detail in some of these questions that you post here, please contact her directly. Uh, also, if you need uh, copies of the slides in PDF form, you have to talk to Hanwei about that. Uh, we know that we are going to be posting the video of this excellent presentation. Give us one day or two to have it in the YouTube. This will be a fantastic resource for everybody who was new or just want to remember the main concepts on that. So with that, do you have any more comments, on we? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, thank you very much again for this presentation. Thanks, everyone. Uh, don't forget, next week is a beautiful technique called atom probe tomography. If you have not seen it yet, I'm sure you're going to be falling in love with that technique. And basically, we will see you again Thursday next week, noontime. And uh, uh, you guys stay safe. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.